Okay, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I am delighted and privileged to be joined this evening by Mr. Simon Fleming, who is a trainee orthopedic surgeon currently completing a PhD in medical education. I think fair to say very active on social media and is well known for being an advocate of culture change, particularly, I suppose, in orthopedic surgery, but in medicine more widely. Simon, thank you for joining me this evening. Thanks for the invite. It's nice to have <laughs> another human being. In these, dare I say, unprecedented times. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's super weird, but you get to do stuff like this in your pyjamas, so I'm not... Me too. Pyjamas, but... <laughs> oh. um, so tonight, the goal is... I'm just sorry, I'm just, my camera's just going to have focus for whatever reason. I'm just going to reset it. Cool. So tonight, the goal is to get an insight into the specialty that is orthopedic surgery. Uh, this is the second uh, interview in the series that, that I've done tonight, but also more widely. Um, so we'll be talking about what an orthopedic surgeon is, what they actually do day to day. Uh, if someone decides that they might want to learn more about orthopedics or they might want to train as one, steps and things that they might have to, to take. And we'll then talk about some of the career options available in orthopedics and, Simon, probably your own work in the culture of orthopedics and how that's, how that's starting to change, potentially. So let's start nice and simple. What is an orthopedic surgeon? Um, so orthopedic surgeons uh, are the for want of a better word to fit the cliche, the carpenters of the surgical world. So we primarily work on the limbs, but we also do some stuff with spines. Um, and we fix primarily bones, um, but we also work on surgically on the things that move bones and joints. So uh, tendons and muscles, and in some cases nerves as well. Um, you know, orthopedics comes from the whole Greek thing about straightening out children. So we were, we were born of helping kids with bent spines come straight. Uh, but now we, we, as a community, fix people who are broken, for want of a better word. That's a, a really good answer, actually. Very succinct. Um, so you said you work on the bones, the limbs, the, the things that the things that move us rather than I guess the the squishy soft parts that kind of keep us um that keep us alive as such yeah. um so what might the typical day-to-day -day, I mean a, a, for context you're an orthopedic registrar um correct yeah. so, a, so a, a trainee yeah so I'm I'm currently uh finishing off my orthopedic training um a typical day so I suppose it's important to clarify that um Orthopedics is, is commonly divided into, you'll hear lots of people talk about T and O, trauma and orthopedics. So um, it'll often depend about whether you're dealing with trauma that day. Trauma is accidents, things that happen to people, car crashes, all the rest. And what, what, when we say orthopedics, we often mean uh, elective stuff, planned stuff, the things that you go via your GP for, for example. So arthritis and back pain and you know, when you hurt your knee playing sports and you see your GP about it, so the more planned kind of thing. Um, your average day tends to start pretty early, so about eight o'clock in the morning uh, is a pretty common start time for a UK uh, orthopedic surgeon. Um, most of us tend to be pretty um, switched on type people. So I tend to like to get in a little bit early, A, because there's no queue for coffee, but B, because um, I just like to be on top of things. I'd rather get in 10, 15 minutes early, get my coffee, make sure that there are no surprises waiting for me. But eight o'clock is a, is a pretty normal start time. And, um, one of the things that orthopedics do that very few other specialties at all have is something called a trauma meeting. Yes. So, um, what you'll hear about a lot in, in medicine in general is a ward round where everyone meets up on the ward and you walk around and you meet all the patients and you, hi, how are you doing? Um, interestingly, what we like to do is we like to do a stage before that. 
called a trauma meeting. And you've got to imagine a room with rows of chairs and there's a, there's variations, right? But the, the standard is either the very front or the very back of the room is the bosses. And then in the middle are the trainees, normally in decreasing levels of seniority going yeah. one way or another. And um, every day, the um, patients who came in over the past 24 hours came into hospital with bumps and breaks and all the rest, plus any operations that we might have done in the past 24 hours, including their x-rays, are discussed. And not just discussed in like a, so, uh, you know, Mrs. Jones fell over next. It's used as a teaching opportunity. So it's great. Yeah. So you've got to imagine that like um, an x-ray of a broken leg comes in and the, the consultant will say to the medical students, what's that? And a medical student will go, it's a broken bone. And they'll go, excellent work. Uh, what bone? And they'll go, a leg bone. And they'll go, cool, name me some leg bones. And they'll say, it's a femur. And they'll go, cool, can you tell me anything more? And they'll go, no, I don't know. And then they'll go to the next level, which will be the very junior doctors. And they'll say, tell me some more about that break. And, and it kind of works up the room until you get to the, the poor suffering senior trainees like me, where they'll be like, name me 48 scientific papers that discuss how you might fix this. And you go, oh, I'm fine. Um, so your average day normally starts with that. And that will take however long it takes because you've got to come up with a plan for the coming 24 hours and potentially for the coming weeks. So you might say, you know, uh, Mrs. Bloggs with that broken femur needs a special piece of equipment or a special surgeon to do it. So she's going to have to wait a couple of days. So we'll line her up for that. Um, uh, but it's a really great learning opportunity. And it's, an, it's normally quite a nice way to start the day. You come up with a plan. And then normally you will go and do a ward round. You'll go and see either the patients that are in the hospital that you have admitted that belong to your team that are known to you in some way, or if you're doing operating that day, you'll be seeing your patients you're operating on. So you'll need to go and meet them and check that they're okay and they're still happy with the plan and all the paperwork is sorted out. And after that ward round, generally you go one of a couple of places. You go to what's called an outpatient clinic, which is where you meet patients, you talk to them, and you either meet new patients and say, hey, what brings you to the hospital today? What's wrong? How can I help? Or follow-up patients. So it's been three months since your operation. How are you doing? How are things? Any problems? Um, and again, that can be a, a trauma-type situation. Oh my goodness, you fell off your bike three weeks ago? Tell me more. Or uh, a more elective thing. So you've had arthritis for five years. Tell me more. Um, you might go to operating theatres. And again, that might be to operate on trauma that's come in. Or it might be to do some planned operations. So classic ones being hip replacements and knee replacements and arthroscopic surgery where we use cameras to look inside knees and shoulders and things. Um, and I guess at least one or two people per day are on call. So they will normally go to accident and emergency or to the wards to see people who've gotten sick or need an orthopedic opinion. Mm -hmm. And that day will generally go on for, well, as long as it needs to go on for. And generally at the end of the day, you, you try and catch up with your colleagues, see if anything's changed, pop onto the wards. But that is like your, your bog standard day, allowing for the fact that normally as a trainee, you're expected to be doing other things too. So you might be expected to be doing projects of some kind or another, and you have to make times for that within your timetable. Um, but as a, as a general rule, you're either on call in clinic or doing an operation is your general life. You're either fixing people, talking to people that you'd like to fix or talking to people that you fixed. So uh, just to, to interject um, before we move on, I, I am currently on my orthopedics rotation, um, my final year of medical awesome. school. Yeah, well, I, I can, I just, for the boys and girls listening at home, what Simon just said, particularly about the outlay of how the trauma round works and, and things like that, it is exactly as Simon describes it. We are in quarter past seven every morning, trauma round at half past seven, um, and literally consultants front row, senior registrars, junior registrars, junior doctors, and then the medical students kind of perched on the back somewhere. 
um, yeah. getting grilled on x-rays. Um, but it is a really good learning experience as described. And when, when you go and as a medical student, when all you guys listening at home, you go to medical school, make the most of those learning opportunities and don't be afraid to ask questions as well. Or to even, you know, in a room full of very, very smart, very, very driven orthopedic surgeons, um, actually my own experience has, has been, they are very willing, you know, if you get something wrong, in, in front of a room actually one of them will take you aside usually and, and say you know do you want some teaching on this that you, you got it wrong do you, do you need us to go over anything they're really friendly yeah I, orthopedics really has a culture of of um a desire to share and to teach knowledge so orthopedic surgeons famously respond really well to um keenness so you're absolutely right you know if you stick your hand up and go why are you doing that? What's going on? I don't understand. They're not going to scream and shout. They're going to go, that's a great question. And realistically, if you ask during the trauma meeting, they'll commonly use that as an opportunity to get one of the other trainees to explain it. So, you know, if you say, oh, boss, um, I don't understand why you're not fixing that person's ankle. They'll go, great question, Ollie. Simon, why don't you explain to Ollie why we're not fixing that ankle? And then I have to remember loads of stuff and explain it to you and it, it's again if it, those meetings are a great opportunity for you to learn tons it's it's case-based learning every day um and and as a as a orthopedic surgeon because we use x-rays in the majority of our surgery um you get uh instant feedback and instant gratification so if you've done a really good job and your x-rays go up it's great to get that kind of feedback. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. If you've struggled or the job is maybe not that great, you know it's coming. But also, you will have people in the room go, yeah, no, that's really tricky. I would have done this. Or, Bit varus. Well, actually, <laughs> right. But, but, but because unlike some of the other specialties where you, you know, where they operate on squidgy things and often you have to wait and see how things go, you know, see if their bowel works, see if their transplant keeps. With us, you can very much look at it and go, you did a good job. You did not so good a job. Here are the things you can do better. Here are the things you did well. And you can normally get that feedback in 24 hours or less from a variety of people. And so I absolutely love that. You know, I fixed something and I know that within 24 hours, I'm going to get some people who are far smarter than me, far better than me, far more experienced than me go, great job, Simon. Um, but you might want to consider doing this next time. Or Simon, what happened here? It doesn't, it doesn't look quite right. And you say, well, I, I got into this struggle and I had to do this. And, and, and again, because you do that throughout your career, you learn very quickly how to both give and receive feedback, mm -hmm. which is, you know, from a medical point of view, like one of the most important things to be able to do. Awesome. And I mean, just because you, I, I want to pick up on the fact that you use the word carpenter at the beginning, um, because one of the things that in my humble view as a medical student, um, and this is as someone who has no particular inclination towards orthopedic surgery, but orthopedics has some of the coolest surgical kind of equipment. Um, kind of kind of available so maybe could you give us an insight on the common operations that an orthopod the the term that is affectionately used to describe orthopedic surgeons right and what sort of operations do you actually do day to day and what kit what's different about the kit yeah so um the carpenter joke is so orthopedic surgeons famously tend to be both simultaneously very very confident and extremely self-deprecating we like to make fun of ourselves um, so we are carpenters is like saying, you know, a cardiothoracic surgeon is a plumber. Um, it, you know, but the reason we do that is because some of the operations we do are very similar to carpentry in the most basic sense of the word. Um, you know, it's like saying that the people who knocked up St. Paul's Cathedral were just builders. Um, uh, so common things we see in trauma are broken bones, basically. And we fix those either with uh, a plate and screws, which is like a metal plate with holes in it and screws like you would get from B&Q or Ikea. Um, 
If we can't do that, we will often put a metal rod down the leg. Um, and if we can't do that, you sometimes see those people with like pins going into their bones and weird frame things on their arms and legs. Mm -hmm. And that's called external fixator. And, and I guess the reason that whether we're doing that or say something uh, more planned, like a hip replacement or a knee replacement, whereby we take someone's arthritis and we, for want of a better word, we cut it out. We cut out the arthritic bit, we throw it in the bin and we replace it with a mixture of metal and plastic and ceramic. But to do that, a lot of the tools we use, people would recognize from home. So uh, hammers, saws, drills and chisels uh, are, are very common tools that we, we use in our day-to-day -day work. When you consider that like your femur, so your thigh bone as a young, fit, healthy human being has the basically the same kind of mechanical properties as concrete. So um, if you break it, it means a lot of force has gotten through it. And equally, if I want to chop a bit out of it because you have a problem, it's not going to be an easy thing. So the, the tools we use are, can be, sorry, uh, pretty, pretty brutal looking. But, you know, then you look at other aspects of orthopedics, which are actually extremely delicate and extremely nuanced, like the spinal surgery or hand surgery or pediatric surgery. And you'll meet some of the most, you know, delicate bits of kit out there as well. Which I guess is a, is a, a really good segue to talking about the different career options, because I think if someone has never visited an orthopedic theatre before, they have certainly, as was the case for me, I had this image of, which admittedly did turn out to be correct, for the first operation that I saw of someone like with a massive hammer whacking great chunks and drilling bones and things like that. But that's not all of orthopedics, right? As you say. So, what are the different pathways that an orthopedic surgeon might follow? Um, so once you decide to be an orthopedic surgeon, if we stay away from the decision to be either, you know, an academic versus say a clinical surgeon, we talk sure. about the broad, the broad strokes of orthopedics, it's primarily broken down into body parts. So um, you can be a hand surgeon, you can be a shoulder and elbows tend to go together. And then you'll get some people who are upper limb surgeons. So they do a bit of everything. Um, shoulder surgeon then kind of leads nicely into, I guess, you'll, you'll meet spine surgeons. Um, you then get the more common things around the pelvis. Pelvic surgeons tend to do very niche stuff and deal with quite complex trauma. You then get um, hip and knee surgeons. So they tend to do a lot of joint replacement work. Uh, so that's your hip replacements and your knee replacements, lots of arthritis surgery. Then you've got surgeons who deal with the foot and the ankle, much like I want to deal with hand and wrist. And then, of course, in the same way you have upper limb surgeons, you get people who are lower limb surgeons, and they do a bit of hip, a bit of knee, a bit of foot and ankle. Um, on top of that, you have pediatric surgeons who, as you might imagine, deal with pediatric stuff. Mm -hmm. Orthopedic tumor surgeons who do pretty much nothing but deal with orthopedic cancer of some kind or another, bone cancers, muscle cancers, that kind of stuff. And then one of the kind of really growing fields we're seeing a lot of now is, is sports surgery. So surgeons who deal with the squidgier bits of orthopedic surgery. So commonly it tends to be shoulder or knee, as you might imagine. Mm. And that's kind of the more soft tissue injuries that you see um, in people who play a lot of sports will get a lot of sporting injuries so you hear about footballers with ACL injuries and you know sportsmen and women with um, hip issues or shoulder issues so that's kind of a growing field and then there are uh, a breed of orthopedic surgeons who are pure trauma and do nothing but um, you know the rock and roll stuff that comes in through the trauma admission stuff and finally, I guess you get the kind of really niche stuff. So you get people who only do really complex things like limb reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So when people's legs are bent and need straightening or short and need lengthening. Um, and they sometimes cross paths a little bit with people who deal a lot with orthopedic infections. So getting infections in your bone or your joint can be really nasty. 
getting an infection if you have metal in there can be even worse. And so there's like a subset of orthopedic surgeons who really like to deal with that kind of stuff too. So, so the great bit of orthopedics is, is there's a bit of the body to suit everyone. So, you know, when I operate on hands, I wear loops, which are the little microscopy glasses things. And I have a hammer, but it's honestly, it's like that big. We call it a coffee hammer. And you're like, ding, 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 ding. Uh, and the drill I use, you hold like a pen. Um, and then you've got friends of mine who do kind of big cancer operations and big limb reconstruction operations where, yeah, they're, they're doing huge stuff. And, and so there's every, every body part has its own flavor and its own nuance. And, and there's something that draws people to one or the other. So, I mean, for example, I've got a lot of friends who want to do hip and knee replacements. Um, and I can absolutely understand why. So aside from cataracts, right, which is where people have problems seeing their eyes go kind of that glassy, cloudy mm -hmm. thing, the hip, oper uh, hip replacement and knee replacement are the two most successful operations in the world in terms of how much they cost and how much time they take to do versus the impact they have on that person and that person's society. So, you know, people come into my hip and knee mates and they are in agony and they can't work and they can't sleep and they have a hip or a knee replacement and they're walking the next day and they're back at work six weeks later and they're back, you know, doing their favorite activity, gardening, whatever, DIY, you know, a couple of weeks after that. So you can absolutely see why, you know, every specialty has its its own little allure and its own little flavor, um, mm -hmm. uh, which, which again, as, a, as an orthopod I've always really liked is um, you don't have to be like a cookie cutter mold of this is what you will do for the rest of your life. You do it all in training, but then you get the choice, the opportunity to specialize. Perfect. So before we talk about, um, so obviously a big part of what you do is about cults change and the orthopedic profile and this kind of thing. Before we do that, very quickly, um, let's say that I am, well, let's say that I am me, a, a final year medical student, just because that's easy for me to imagine. Um, and I've, I've decided that, you know what, I really, really like orthopedics. I want to be an orthopedic I surgeon. I not believe you. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> um, I know that very quickly what happened is that I um I went to see a a, a neuro spine list one weekend one of the surgeons uh, one of the neurosurgical registrars who was kind of looking after me this is my first foray into what neurosurgery was and um she said oh we're doing a spine op come in on Sunday you know the surgeons will see you keen we'll get you in and it was a a lumbar spine decompression um and uh that was such a brutal operation. I thought that neurosurgery at this point was this very, you know, we'll go in, we'll excise a single neuron while Mozart plays in the background and stuff like this. And someone comes in with a hammer and a chisel and a pair of what I now know are called bone nibblers, like the things where you snap off bits of the spine. <laughs> what on earth is this um, that I've walked into? Um, but uh, let's say I want to become an orthopedic surgeon and um, I'm preparing to become a junior doctor. Uh, how can I go about making sure that I become an orthopedic surgeon like Simon? Um, realistically, whenever you make that decision, it's about kind of keeping your eye on the prize. So whether you're a medical student when you make that decision or whether you're uh, you know, a, a doctor when you make that decision, that's when kind of the ball starts rolling. So um, orthopedics is one of the more competitive specialties in medicine in general. Yeah, uh, it just is, which of course massively feeds our ego, but it's, it's because it's tough. It's tough to do. It's it's a very skilled profession, much like a lot of professions are. Um, and there aren't as many jobs out there as there are for some other things. Um, also, it's competitive because we need more orthopedic surgeons in the world, basically. So we want the best people to come and be orthopedic surgeons. So you would, as a as a medical student, if you wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, you would 
start trying to do some projects in orthopedics. You would find someone like me and you would go, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon, help. And so you get some mentors, which is vital. And um, you try and get some projects, try and just get a taste of what that looks like. So maybe you gather a bit of data for me and maybe you come to theatres a little bit. And you start to get a feel for what it's like. So that when you become a junior doctor, you start heading down that surgical pathway. So you have to sit some exams as a, as a very junior doctor if you want to be a surgeon called the, the MRCS, the Membership of the Royal College of Surgeons. And you're, so you're simultaneously doing your junior doctor job, whatever that is. Uh, you're revising for the MRCS because you want to be a surgeon and you're trying to do some projects to make you look competitive. So you're building your, your curriculum vitae, your CV. Um, you'll do one or two years at least as a foundation doctor, during which time hopefully you've, you've ticked some boxes. Um, and then you have to become a core surgical trainee. Now you might decide to take a year or two out before you become a core surgical trainee and go do a teaching job or you're in Australia or whatever. And that's really common. And, and personally, we in orthopedics love it. We want like well-rounded individuals, right? Because we don't need these like machines that can just memorize stuff. We need people who've lived and done stuff. And so generally people tend to do often will do a year after their foundation jobs. And they'll, if you want to be an orthopedic surgeon, you might get a job working in a big orthopedic unit just to get a taste for what that's like, or you might get a Canada and see what that's like. Anyway, then you become a core surgical trainee and that's two years. And during those two years, because you have now gone from being a foundation doctor where you're expected in theory to get a bit of a taste of everything, you've now declared yourself, you're a surgeon. Ollie is going to be a surgeon. So your focus moves from ticking some boxes to ticking some new boxes, getting to theatres more, uh, trying to do some slightly more advanced projects, scientifically speaking, um, and getting ready for applying to be in my job, uh, uh, an orthopedic registrar, where there's a, a interview process to get in. And basically there's something called a person specification. You can find it online. Um, and it's the person specification is quite tick boxy. Uh, Ollie must have done this, this many courses and this many exams and this many audits and this many projects. And, and so the kind of ticking off the basic expectations of what we're looking for in an orthopedic surgeon is, um, is not easy, but it's not difficult. It is just a matter of putting one foot in front of the other. It's all the other stuff that makes you an orthopedic surgeon. So it's about where your strengths lie. So if you, uh, were you sort of thing you might decide to do a podcast about orthopedics or your journey you might decide to uh, build an app you might whatever that is those little things that just like trying to get into medical school really those little things that make people go wow fascinating hmm. and then you come to national selection so orthopedics is selected through a national interview process uh, uh, where you then are competing against everyone and then you're ranked and depending on where you then basically pick where you want to go and the first person gets their first choice and so on and so forth. Um, and we did that to make it as fair as possible so that, you know, cause you're based in Warwick or around Warwick, right? Around so we the don't Coventry, you, Warwick area. Coventry, right. So we don't want you being interviewed by the person that you've just worked for cause they might show you favoritism. So instead we have this very fair system that get, we work very hard so that the, the best people get the best jobs and it rules out as much as possible favoritism and all that sort of stuff, which does no one any favors. Uh, and then you start your career as an orthopedic registrar and that takes at the shortest time, uh, S, uh, three, four, about six years. Um, so in theory, you can go from qualifying from medical school to being a fully qualified orthopedic surgeon in about 10 years. Um, more commonly than not, people do some other bits and bobs, whether that's after their foundation years, after their core years, like me, they decide to take some time out of training to do a PhD, whatever that looks like. Uh, but yeah, um, and, and again, 
the the roots are endless. So if you decide, uh, Ollie, to start a family, uh, you could go less than full time, and you could um, only work four days a week rather than five days a week, so that you could have Friday with your family. Um, if you uh, decided to um, for example, become an active member of the trade union and, and be really busy with that, you could go to 50 or 60% and you could work half the week and spend the other half of the week working at the British Medical Association. Sure. Um, so, so flexible training is something that orthopedics does pretty well, actually. And um, it's something we're quite proud of that we, we make work pretty well. That, yeah, that, I think, well, that, that I think brings us then to the perhaps the the meat and potatoes of your work um if if i may which is this um this idea of culture change because less than full time many specialties still not very amenable to that at all um or rather some are better than others and orthopedics is certainly i think used as an example of one that tends to be better um so the well, I'm sure you can give the take, right? People have this image of what the typical orthopedic surgeon looks like. And that's maybe, yeah, maybe not even before people go to medical school, but certainly when you go to medical school, there seems to be this zeitgeist yeah. idea. I didn't, I didn't know any of this till I went to medical school. And then I got told as a first year medical student that I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. It turns out to be true, but I had no idea. Yeah. And, and... Uh, my my partner watches Grey's Anatomy, right? I don't, I think it's, anyway. Um, and in the most recent couple of series, there have been orthopedic surgeons. And the first episode where they turn up, these two kind of bros with rolled up sleeves uh, turn up and they're the like archetypal jock from every American film you've ever seen. Yeah. And they actually say out loud, don't worry, the ortho gods are here. And, and I kind of roll my eyes, but it is the cliche. Uh, orthopedic surgeons, the cliche of the orthopedic surgeon is that they are the archetypal white public school educated rugby boy. And that's because they were for a very long time. It was, you know, cliches and stereotypes are born from truth. Uh, and for a very, very, very long time, orthopedics was primarily a white male specialty and over recent years it has been recognized that that's a bad thing and that a lack of diversity both in terms of characteristics so uh, gender sex age race all that sort of stuff and in terms of diversity of thought mm -hmm. as in hey i've thought of a different way of doing things are what you need if you want to be the best if you want to grow and if you want to care for a population that is far more diverse than your workforce. So over the last couple of years, there has been a massive, massive push of which I've been a part. And I'm, I'm both privileged to have been a part of it and recognize that I've only been able to be a part of it because of my privilege, right? Sure. I have power because I'm a straight white guy um, uh, to increase the diversity we see in orthopedics. Um, so up until very recently, there were very, very, very few women in orthopedics. Now within trainees, who are of course the future of the specialty, it's about 20, 25% female. Okay. It's not perfect, but we're getting there. And, and all, these, all these pieces of work around, you know, you, you really can't be what you can't see. And so if you look at the current British Orthopaedic Training Association, BOTA, which if you want to be an orthopaedic surgeon, you should really be a member of as a medical student. Um, the current president is a, is a really good friend of mine, and she is an amazing uh, woman of color who's currently on mat leave. Like she is absolutely the example of something that 10 or 20 years ago, you just wouldn't have seen, not really. And if, if so, it, she would have very much been the outside. There'd been sure. such a rarity. But if you look at regions like um, Wessex, so that's the kind of Southampton, Portsmouth area of the world, um, half their trainees are female. Um, 
many of them are less than full time and and not just in the UK, but kind of globally, orthopedics did this big piece of work where we just took a long, hard look in the mirror and recognized that we had to do better. And very rapidly because of the orthopedic personality, which tends to be quite pragmatic, like, wow, we're not, we're not doing as best we can. Why will we better do better then? And how can we do better? Right, well, we'll do that. So very rapidly, there was a move towards well, then how can we increase diversity and how can we widen participation and how can we challenge these stereotypes of orthopedics only only being for a certain type of person from a certain type of background and what you will find now if you go into most orthopedics de departments is it doesn't look the way it used to look and it doesn't sound the way it used to sound and I mean, realistically, that's only a good thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. We're not there yet. We're not perfect. But because, because of the kind of attitudes most orthopedic surgeons have, we're kind of not going to quit until we've got it right. So we're not looking for um, that kind of equality whereby you go 50-50, job done. We're actually looking for equity whereby everyone has the same opportunities. and and you can't have diversity unless you have inclusion. So we're doing very a lot of work around really looking at like, what are the barriers? What are the barriers to people becoming an orthopedic surgeon? Is it money? Is it class? Is it race? Is it you can't be what you can't see? Is it medical school curricula? Is it um, the fact that uh, a lot of, because of the nature of the beast, right? As I was saying, because of our past, um, you go to a conference and all the conference, orthopedic conferences used to be old white guys talking like old white guys. So it was a big ask to say, look, we need to stop that. We, uh, we need to have no more all male panels, no more all white panels. We, all those little things kind of add up. So for example, um, and I, you know, I do this, but whenever I get an invite to talk, I'm very aware that, yeah, sure, I do a lot of medical education and I'm a culture change advocate and all that sort of stuff. But I ask, like, can I just know that both the panel or the piece of work I'm doing and the wider conference is going to be both diverse and inclusive? And if they can't assure me of that, I have to decline. Now, that in itself comes from a place of privilege, right? Because I'm my CV is good enough that I can say no. You to can talk, afford to do that, right? Yeah. I can afford to say I don't need that. That's a big ask if you are um, maybe not as lucky as I am and a man, and you've been asked to sit on an all male panel, and you're like, "But I, I need to do this talk for my career." Or for, but it's a big ask, and it's like you know what? It'll pay off. And we're asking people to do, do these things that actually are hard. Um, and we're asking people to advocate and we're asking people to do all these sort of things. And what we're seeing is a massive change in the kind of people who want to be orthopedic surgeons, which is just the best thing ever. Um, so we're getting there. Like, you know, if you, if you are interested in orthopedics and you join the British Orthopedic Training Association and you follow people like me on, on Twitter or Instagram, you will, you will start to see the wider world that is out there. Uh, and it is not as male, pale and stale as it was 10, 20 years ago. Amazing. And just one, one final question to, to end on. Um, as I, I asked Amy, who I interviewed earlier this evening about general surgery, um, what is your one just golden kind of piece of advice or thing to remember if someone decides they want to be a successful orthopedic surgeon, what would you say to them? Ooh, there's loads of them, right? Um, I think if you want to be an orthopedic surgeon, if you want to fix people, which is what I want to do, I think it's probably that actually work hard, play hard is important. The best orthopedic surgeons I know 
are passionate about what they do so that they can do the best for their patients, but recognize that it's only with kind of work-life integration and taking care of yourself that you are at your best to work hard to take care of your patients. So if you can find that balance, if you can be that person who, you know, is, is comfortable taking a rest day because you know you've worked really hard the previous couple of days, you will find that what otherwise could be, be a, really, a really difficult training program just becomes a joy. Amazing. Are you happy for people to contact you, Simon, or, or to, you know, if you've got any projects to plug or uh, social yeah. media handles? Social media, Orthopod Reg on Twitter and Instagram. Come find me. Perfect. We'll make sure that there are links to that, guys, uh, both on the video overlaid and in the description. Mr. Simon Fleming, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My absolute pleasure. All right. Take care, Simon. Thank you.